Hey everyone, this is my rebuttal video to Pastor Jeff Durbin. He's at Apologian Church in Phoenix, Arizona, my old stomping grounds. He does a lot of work with James White, so I was really interested in this recent sermon of his on the question, does the Bible teach Scripture alone, or the doctrine of sola scriptura? Uh, before I get into that, I will say a big thanks to everyone who's supporting the channel and for your comments to help me learn how to do these rebuttal videos better. Some people thought the Mike Winger videos were going too fast, so I think I'll keep the playback speed at around... 1.25. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire sermon, because not all of it's related to the argument about Sola Scriptura. I'm just going to focus on those parts related to the question, does the Bible teach the Protestant doctrine of Sola Scriptura? So in this part, Pastor Durbin talks about how Sola Scriptura distinguishes Protestants from Catholics and Mormons and Muslims, but then he takes it further than I've actually seen a Protestant pastor ever do when it comes to what the Bible alone teaches us. Orthodoxy. But how about other questions that Sola Scriptura actually does connect to? How about the claims of Alcoholics Anonymous? How about the claims of Alcoholics Anonymous? Is addiction a disease? Is it merely a brain disease of addiction? They make all kinds of claims in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sola Scriptura does actually relate to that as well. Do I listen to the voice of Dr. Bob about addiction ultimately, or do I listen to the voice of God in his word about our nature, what the problem of addiction is, how do we define addiction, how do we get free from addiction ultimately? We have to also ask the I would be really concerned about someone taking this advice and doing something that's unhealthy for them. I agree that sometimes people justify certain sins by just saying, well, I'm addicted and I can't help it. No, you are a human being. You have a rational mind. Uh, you have a soul. You have free will. Uh, but at the same time, we can do things to mess up our brains, uh, the neurochemistry in our brains, to become physically or chemically addicted to something. Uh, and if we don't recognize that, that sometimes we might need medicine, we might need kinds of treatment that were not available in biblical times in order to no longer become addicted to certain substances or even to certain behaviors. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just concerned here that people say, oh, Sola Scriptura, what is Sola Scriptura about? What is it? fundamentally about. Some people say, well, it's the Bible alone. About what? Is it about how I get to heaven? Is it about all Christian faith and doctrine? Is it about now beyond Christian faith and doctrine to the science of addiction? Or here's some other topics Pastor Jeff brings up. Question related to other issues, like how, like how about the Constitution? Is the Constitution ultimate? How do we know what's right about the Constitution and what may be wrong about the Constitution? How do we know how to properly define those things? Sola Scriptura actually relates to that as well in terms of how do I know the truth? What's ultimate? How about the issue related to Roe v. Wade? How do we define life? Is it true that we can uh, <coughs> execute a child in the womb? Is that the image of God or no? Do we see that as ultimate or do we obey God rather than men? Two things. One, a lot of Protestants in the 20th century justified their pro-choice position by saying the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn abortion, so therefore it's not a sin. Much the same way that many Protestants today will say that the Bible does not explicitly condemn contraception, so there's nothing wrong with contraception. So it's not as clear-cut as Pastor Durbin would like to make it out to be. Second, once again, if we're saying the Bible teaches sola scriptura, then the Bible should also tell us what Sola Scriptura is. And once again, Protestants disagree. Is it about faith and morals? Does it include uh, addiction, how to understand the Constitution that was written 1,700 years after the Apostolic Age? Where Always ask yourself, where, where is the Bible saying this about Sola Scriptura? And in actuality, what you will find is not clear biblical teaching, but sparse references to the Bible where Pastor Durbin and other Protestants will read into Scripture to get it to say something they want it to say instead of what it actually says. These questions can go on and on, but these do relate to us, and they touch every aspect of our lives. We need to answer this question, of course, in two ways. Again, standalone message. I'd love to do this for six weeks, but standalone message. We need to answer the question biblically and philosophically, biblically and philosophically. Now, a quick definition. If you haven't written it down, if you don't know it, a quick definition is sola scriptura is the claim that scripture alone is the sole, listen closely, very important, don't lose this, because people that apostatize away from the faith and fall into other areas seem to always miss these specific words. Scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith and practice for the church. The sole infallible, without error, rule of faith and practice for the church. Now, if you've been in Apologia Church for really 
any bit of time, you know that at Apologia Church, we do our catechism every Sunday. We're a confessional church, 1689 all the way, baby. 1689, London Baptist Confession of Faith. We have a rule of faith that we actually go over every Lord's Day before, uh, before the message itself. We talk about uh, catechism question and answer, but we always go back to the scripture and memorize scripture together. So we know that there are actually other rules of faith. So when this claim, I've heard this before, that sola scriptura is just the claim that the Bible is the sole infallible rule of faith. But I always ask, well, what does that mean for the Bible to be a rule of faith or the only infallible rule of faith? Does that mean as a Christian, you are free to believe whatever you want as long as it does not contradict the Bible? Then in that case, Catholics could subscribe to sola scriptura in that sense, that most Protestant apologists, when they criticize the Catholic faith, uh, on justification and salvation, they'll try to say it contradicts scripture, which it, it doesn't. Uh, we could get into that in, a, in another video. Usually what they'll say is, you know, where's the Pope? Where's the Mass? Where's the Assumption of Mary? Where's Purgatory? Where is that in the Bible? So it's not just the rule of faith is you cannot believe things which contradict the Bible. I think it's something bigger, which is this. You should, a Christian can only believe in that which is explicitly taught in Scripture. We only believe that which is explicitly taught in the Bible, and Christians must believe what is explicitly taught in the Bible. I think that is what Pastor Durbin and others mean by sola scriptura, uh, whether it applies to faith and morals or even beyond that, like when you talk about the science of addiction or legal theories of constitutional interpretation, I guess. But once again, okay, fine, if that's basically your definition of sola scriptura, where is that in the Bible? We use them. The Westminster Confession of Faith, Christians have used in history, the 1689 difference, ours is better. Um, that was a joke for all the Presbyterians in the audience. You know I love you. Okay. You guys are like, it's better because you copied it. But um, you also have the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. You have confessions. Christians have rules of faith. So did you hear it? Sola Scriptura is the teaching that Scripture alone is the sole, listen, infallible, without error, rule of faith and practice for the church. So here it is. Ready? Taking notes. What Sola Scriptura does not teach us. Listen closely. These are important elements to this truth. Sola Scriptura does not teach us that there aren't other rules of faith possible. Again, Westminster, you've got um, the 39 Articles of Faith of the Anglican Church when it was doing basically all right. You see some solid truths in there. You see a rule of faith there, confessions of faith. Again, in history, you've got the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, all these different creeds that are solid, beautiful, amazing things. And why or how do you know they're amazing and beautiful and wonderful? because they're articulated that way, because it's historic, because the church believed it, you know that it's wonderful because it's based on the truth of Scripture, the Word of God. There can be rules of faith, like the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Yeah, there can be other rules of faith, but they're always subordinate to the one infallible rule, which is Scripture. So while Protestants like Jeff Durbin are going to say, well, yeah, we have other rules of faith, they really don't, because here's my question, which rule do you pick? Which one do you pick? Do you pick... Um, the which ecumenical councils. I'm sure they'll pick some of the earlier councils on Christology. Will Pastor Durbin uh, take the Council of Ephesus and its rule of faith about proclaiming Mary Theotokos, God-bearer, the mother of God? How about the later councils of Lyon, Lateran, ecumenical councils of the First Vatican, the Second Vatican Council? Oh, we, we don't take that. What about other creeds or confessions from uh, more... Arminian uh, theologian, those that are not Reformed or not Calvinist, well, we don't, we don't take those. So what ends up happening is which rules, which creeds, which confessions, which, which councils do we pick? Whichever one lines up with our personal interpretation of Scripture. So these other rules of faith, you're not subordinate to them. You just pick the rules that correspond with your previous personal interpretation of Scripture, whatever they may be. Uh, William Lane Craig's a great example of this. He's a great evangelical theologian, philosopher. He's also a monothelite. He believes that Christ had only one will, even though that was a heresy condemned at the Third Council of Constantinople. Here's what Craig says about it. He says, No earnest Christian wants to be considered a heretic, but we Protestants recognize Scripture alone as our ultimate rule of faith. Therefore, we bring even the statements of ecumenical councils before the bar of Scripture. So they may say they have other rules of faith, but it's really only one, their personal interpretation of Scripture and then finding support for that, I think. However, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith is only true insofar that it actually agrees with the infallible rule of faith, the Word of God. Hence, that is basically the one rule of faith 
that they, that they have. Now, what does Sola Scriptura also not teach us? It does not teach us that we can't learn from church history. When we say scripture alone, we're not saying, as Pastor James often says, that we have just us and ourselves under a tree with our Bible, nobody else around, just us, just me, my own interpretation, this is the only thing, me and the Bible. That's not sola scriptura, even in history. That's not what Christians have meant by sola scriptura, that it's just you and your Bible off on your own, and you don't even have the benefit of the church, don't need the benefit of the church, you don't need teachers. That's not sola scriptura. Well... Remember, going back throughout history, we're only going back a few hundred years when we're talking about the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura. And there are other Protestants who would disagree with Pastor Durbin. You go to the 19th century, there was a big restorationist movement. You had people who said, not only were Catholics wrong, but Protestants are wrong. We got to bring back the ancient church. And Protestants and Catholics have misunderstood the Bible. So you got Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Alexander Campbell, once said, he endeavored to read the scriptures as though no one had read them before me. So it's just not true. Uh, there are other Protestants who would say, yeah, it's just you and your Bible. And if you find a church that agrees with you, great, but you don't need that. Uh, once again, this if this is the doctrine of sola scriptura, it has, it's not this, we have other rules of faith, and we're not saying that history plays no part. Where does the Bible say any of this? Right now, it's just he's proposing, Pastor Durbin is proposing his particular system, but where's the Bible uh, saying, saying any of this? If you believe that Scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith and practice, then you go to that Bible, and what does it say Jesus did? He created a church. And what did he give? He gave apostles. What else? He gave teachers, right? What else? He gave administrators and people who are evangelists and all the rest. God gives us the church. He gives you pastors with authority, local authority, not ultimate authority, in the church. You see that. So when we say sola scriptura, we do not mean... And this is, by the way, let's make a confession as people... Wait, wait a minute here. He gave us the church? Pastors with authority, with local authority? Where is this church? Where did the pastors get this authority? Um, I think in the Protestant world, it's common for you to either go to seminary or not. You just hang up your shop, you begin preaching, and if you acquire a congregation, you're a pastor. It's on par with kind of how the rabbis were able to have authority uh, in, in Jesus' time, people who saw them as being learned teachers of the law and being willing to follow them. It's different than saying, look at the Bible, where do pastors in the Bible get their authority? From the apostles. The apostles laid their hands on them, or they laid hands on people who laid hands on others. You had that apostolic succession that is preserved in the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, but the idea of the Protestant idea, you can just choose to become a pastor on your own because you're moved by the Spirit, or that a congregation can vote and elect you to be a pastor. That's not what we find in, in Scripture at all. So if we apply Sola Scriptura to that, it's, it's, not what we, it's not what we get. D.A. Carson had a good commentary on this. He says that in Scripture, that church, ecclesia, it, it, it was used to refer to the congregation of all believers in one city. You never hear of churches in Antioch or Jerusalem or Ephesus, but the church in those cities, the one church. You're not supposed to just go and just join a church, you join the church. And I would say, does the church that is talked about in the Apostles and the Church Fathers, does it still exist today? It's not going to be the Protestant churches, they're 1,600, 1,500 years uh, too late. People who would be historically called Protestants, which is what we are, let's make a confession. People have perverted and distorted this particular doctrine to the degree that you've got people, I know people personally, who have professed faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. They say that they're saved, but they haven't been a part of a church in 40, 45, 50 years. They never crossed the doors. Why? Well, because all I need is the Bible. That's it. Just Jesus, me, and the Bible. The Word of God. That's it. I don't need the benefit of the church. None of those things. Sola Scriptura does not teach that we cannot learn from church history. It does not teach that the church is insignificant. We need to remember this. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Giants. Better men and better women than we are. Yeah, but who do we pick from those in the past? Are they going to pick from St. Thomas Aquinas? Are they going to pick uh, Charles Borromeo? Or are they going to pick, I guess, Charles Spurgeon, John Calvin? There's everyone to pick from. We stand on the shoulders of giants, but ultimately the sources you listen to are just those that back your own personal interpretation of Scripture, even to the point of dissecting them. You look at St. Augustine. Many Reformed people will claim Augustine as their own. B.B. Warfield, a Protestant scholar, he once said that Augustine's doctrine of grace defeated his doctrine of the Church. 
And a lot of Protestants have a hard time. They really agree with Augustine on grace, uh, but they don't like that he's so committed to the Catholic Church that Augustine once said, I would not believe in the Gospels if I were not moved by the authority of the Catholic Church. Uh, Warfield even said that Augustine's understanding of grace and the Church were like two children struggling in the womb of his mind. It reminds you of Jacob and Esau a little bit in the Old Testament. Uh, but once again, there's claims that that has authority, but ultimately the authority resides in the individual's interpretation of Scripture and what they're going to align with that. So Sola Scriptura does not teach that we can't, as Christians, grow on the basis of the Word of God, sharper in our communication of the Word of God. What Sola Scriptura does say, Sola Scriptura does say that the nature of Scripture is that it is one, God breathed. That is the nature of Scripture. God breathed. Help me out here now. Where's the verse that says Scripture is God breathed? Well, I know, okay, now look at you guys, fancy apologians. You guys are like, that's Theonoustos, Pastor Jeff. I know that one. I know some Greek. Yeah, okay. What is it in Greek? It is what? Theonoustos. And what does it mean? Breathed out by God. But what's the, what's the reference? 2 Timothy 3.16. You need to know the reference. 2 Timothy 3.16. Before we continue, I want to add that many Protestant apologists, I notice this, when they make a case for Sola Scriptura, they will pile on top, pile over and over, how the praising Scripture, noting how Scripture is invested with authority, that is divinely inspired, uh, that it settles disputes. And as a Catholic, I would say, amen, amen, amen. But I need the word only in there, that the Word of God is confined only to the written Word. Uh, that all Christian doctrine is explicitly found only in Scripture. Just because something has divine authority, just because God inspired it, does not mean it is the only source of authority. That's the hurdle the Protestant apologists need to get over, and they, they really can't. So the fact that Scripture is theonostos, beautiful. It's inspired by God. But that, in and of itself, the use of that word does not prove the doctrine of sola scriptura, because the Bible does not say the only source of authority for a Christian is that which is theonoustos. The Bible doesn't say that. Uh, that's an assumption brought into the debate, but that assumption has to be defended with Scripture if you're going to say the Bible teaches the doctrine of sola scriptura. All Scripture is theonoustos. It is breathed out by God. The picture there is put your hand in front of your face, and as you're talking to your hand, you feel the breath hitting your palm. That is breathed out. So when Scripture talks about the Word of God, it says all Scripture is theonoustos. It is breathed out by God. So what is Scripture? It's from the mouth of God. It's God's revelation. It is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. That's the nature of it. How about the origin of Scripture? The origin of Scripture. I want you guys to go in your Bible. That That's it. It's just, it's it's... Breathe out by God, it's Theonostos, but that does not prove Sola Scriptura. In the early church, some of the writings of the church fathers were described by Christians as being Theonostos, as being God-breathed. But that didn't mean they were the sole infallible rule of faith. The word Theonostos, I think, only appears once in the New Testament, and it's very scant in the extant Greek literature. Uh, so we would say, yes, of course, God inspired the Bible. Uh, but even here, what Pastor Durbin takes from this, he reads his own interpretation in that God breathed out the word of scriptures. Other biblical scholars will say theonostos means God breathed into human words and conferred divine authorship on them. I'm not going to settle what the exact meaning of the term is here in this verse, but my point is, just because you point out that scripture is inspired, you, you don't get sola scriptura from that, because many of the early Christians believed uh, they would point to works of the fathers and say that they are inspired, that even some works of pagan poetry were inspired. You have to get, does the text say that all Christian doctrine is found only and explicitly in the Bible? So far, we, have, we don't have that yet in this presentation. Now, just a quick side, and we're going to get right to the text here, and we're going to do a brief, I don't have a lot of verses to give you today because it's a standalone message, but just as a side to answer some questions, the church did not create the canon of Scripture by authoritative declaration. This is important. I know I don't have time to develop this a lot today. I just need to say it in the discussion of Sola Scriptura because it does come up. People talk about Sola Scriptura. Well, you don't have the scriptures except for the church telling you what the Bible is. By the way, that is fallacious and not true. That's not how we know what the Bible is or have the Bible. The church didn't create the canon of scripture by authoritative declaration. I don't believe in these 66 books 
Because the church made an authoritative declaration, here's your Bible, you believe that. We've created the word of God. That's not how it happened historically. That's not what it looked like. Here's the truth. The word of God created the church. The word of God created and formed the church. Note the equivocation. Do you mean the Bible made the church? Because that doesn't make sense. The church came into existence at Pentecost before any single document of the New Testament was written. The church existed for 20 years without any documents of the New Testament. Even when you get to the end of the first century, you have all the documents are written, but you don't have anywhere near a universal consensus as to which written documents alone constitute the canon of Scripture. As I noted in my video of Pastor Mike Winger, you do not have unanimity in the church and understanding of what the canon is until after the regional councils of Hippo and Carthage in the 4th century. So he's right, if by word of God he means the revelation of God that was given both written and unwritten form, such as the preaching of the apostles, that is what created the church. And you're right, the church did not say, these are the books of the Bible, and created them out of thin air. The church doesn't make scripture, God writes scripture. But the church does have the authority to tell us what writings are scripture and which ones are not. And notice also in this discussion, Pastor Durbin never explains how he knows the 66 books of the Protestant Bible are inspired. He doesn't say, if he says, well, because I just know God wrote them, because he did. A Mormon could say that about the Book of Mormon. A Muslim could say that about the, the Quran. He never, in this video, he never provides an answer to the question. Uh, whereas as a Catholic, I can, because I believe that God uh, created a church. Jesus rose from the dead. He established a church through the apostles and their successors, and the deposit of faith was transmitted faithfully through them and their successors in a written and unwritten form. And then when there were controversies about the nature of the written form of revelation, the church is able to weigh in on it, first at regional councils, and then finally when there was a large kerfuffle with the Protestant Reformation at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. But there are steps to be able to determine that from the Catholic perspective. The Protestant perspective say, well, these books are inspired because they're inspired, that just ends up being invalid circular reasoning. So then what happens here is Pastor Durbin uh, goes on a long excursus uh, through Genesis 2 and 3 and talks about the fall of man and how essentially what happened was Adam and Eve didn't listen to God. They didn't follow what God said because God said it. And the fall of man happened and sin entered the world. And then he takes from that that this is a teaching of the doctrine of sola scriptura. I don't see how he gets that from Genesis because nothing was written down. God spoke to Adam and Eve. So if the lesson is don't disobey the word of God, amen, I totally agree. But you can't get that because God spoke his word and it was disobeyed to Adam and Eve, from that, the word of God is confined to the written word alone. You, you can't get that at all. ...of all the rest. The fall enters, sin enters, death enters, and it enters at this point of the voice of God versus another voice. So how should they have handled that conflict? Sola Scriptura. God says. That's the rule. That's the foundation. Quick thing, Old Testament, just a working out of this truth, this fun fundamental truth in Scripture. God says and test everything else by that standard. If you Keep watching for the equivocation. The Word of God, God speaks to 66th book of the Protestant canon. It's equivocating here. It's a, a standard fallacy. Uh, just because God speaks doesn't mean we have the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura. God speaks, and usually throughout salvation history, and especially in the history of the New Testament church, the word of God is spoken orally. It's not written down. Jesus himself, prior to his ascension into heaven, never told anyone to write anything down. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 13 in the law of God, Deuteronomy chapter 13, God gives his people a test for prophets, dreamers of dreams, those who actually give you truths from God. And here it is, we've quoted this thousands of times outside of the Mormon temple in Mesa, Arizona and in Salt Lake City. In Deuteronomy 13, 1, here's the test for God's people. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or a wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So here, in this particular passage for God's people, God says this. If somebody comes and they have this miraculous ministry, it looks so legit, like they're making legs longer. People are getting slain in the Spirit. 
People are rising from the dead. I mean, the miraculous is in their midst. I wouldn't mind trying to find a Protestant pastor whose gift is to make people's legs longer because I, I feel like I'm getting shorter. Does that happen to you? I used to think I was a solid five foot 11, could maybe pass for six feet. Now I'm a solid five foot 10. So if there's somebody out there that can make my, my legs longer, my, my spine a little longer, if you have the charism, I will, I will give you a call. God says, if even the wonder comes to pass, however, the prophet or dreamer of dreams leads you after other gods, gods which you have not known, that's how you know there are false prophets. So again, here's another example of that classic contrast in scripture, that conflict. You've got the voice of God laid down as the foundation, and the other voice must be tested by the previous revelation. It's in the garden. It's in Deuteronomy 13. How were the people of God to know whether this prophet or dreamer of dreams was representing the true God? Here's the answer. If they lead you after a different God, different from how I've revealed myself to you, that's how you know they're a false prophet. Now watch. How does this work out in our conflict in the world? But this doesn't prove sola scriptura. All it's saying is you can accept something as divine revelation if it doesn't tell you to worship another God. Well, Catholicism doesn't tell people to worship some other God. We disagree on, on how to worship the true God. But even here, this argument wouldn't, from a Protestant perspective, even invalidate the Catholic faith. So once again, you're going back to scripture of a warning against idolatry and forsaking God to trying to drive sola scriptura into the verse. And that's simply what it doesn't mean. It's just saying uh, you can accept someone as a prophet if they don't lead you away from the true God. Otherwise, if you have it that, oh, well, you can only accept someone's prophecy if it already perfectly corresponds with the revelation that's already been given, what do you do if God wants to give new revelation? And we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about Acts uh, 17, when we get here towards more of the, the end of the video. Also, I want to say, I've been hearing little kids shouting in the background. I say, good on Pastor Durbin. Love seeing kids at church, by the way. Uh, if your church isn't crying, your church is dying. So, Keep bringing the kids, people. So good on you all for that. I will give you props for that. I hate, I just, I, I have little kids. So I hate when people give them stink eyes when they're making age appropriate vocalizations. If they're crying their head off, take them outside. But they should be allowed to make an age appropriate vocalization. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Well, you see this conflict happening between us and the Latter day Saints, us and Islam, us and the Watchtower, us and Christian scientists, us and David Koresh, and all the rest. What do we do? We say, what are you saying? Okay, but God says this. So when Joseph Smith says in the King Fall at Discourse, we've imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away and do away the veil so that you may see. And he says, you've got to learn to become gods yourselves the same way all gods have done before you. Now, did you know that in Joseph Smith's early um, ministry that there were claims to the miraculous in his, earth, or in his early ministry? Many claims to the miraculous happened often. It happened, happens often in many different cults. So here you have people who are claiming even the miraculous in early, early Mormonism, but how do you know Joseph Smith was a charlatan, a fraud, a false prophet? Because God says. When Joseph says that God was not eternally God, and that you could become a God one day yourself, you look at the Bible itself, and it says Psalm 90, verse 2. From eternity into eternity, you are God. Joseph Smith's a liar. He's a fraud. He's a charlatan. Why? Because God says, and then Joseph says. When you look at the scripture, but once again, Catholics are not telling people to worship other gods like Mormons do. Now, Pastor Durbin may say, well, yeah, as a Catholic, though, you're saying believe in the Eucharist, or you're saying you can be saved, that works have something to do with your salvation. So therefore, you really are telling people to worship other gods in the sense that you're not being faithful to what the Bible says. Well, I can say for Pastor Durbin and other Reformed individuals, I would say, uh, how about you all with that you can never lose your salvation or the limited atonement? Uh, now, I don't know exactly what Pastor Durbin's views are on that. I would assume they're probably similar to James White since they work together so much, though I know James White works with Michael Brown, and they actually differ a lot on this, but that's just an assumption I'm putting out there. If I'm wrong, I'll uh, correct that in a, in a future video, but let's just even take a hypothetical reformed individual who could be saying these same things. Uh, by that logic, you know, you're leading people after false gods here. Once again, the Bible's admonition to say you should not trust a prophet if they tell you to worship someone who is not Yahweh, who is not the true God, that is not proof of sola scriptura. You're just you're not you're not able to derive that from the warnings against idolatry scriptures you know that god has already said over and over again 
Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other God. I know not one. Joseph Smith says that there's many gods, a plurality of gods, and you can become one one day. That's how I know Joseph Smith is a false prophet. And you go down the line. You take God's word and you compare it to Muhammad's word. God's word and you compare it to Charles Taze Russell's word. God's word and you compare it to the word of your governor. God's word, and you compare it to the word of your mom and dad, and you test, and you see, is this the truth? How do I know? Because God says. That's the foundation of Sola Scriptura. Scripture is the breathed out revelation of God. The origin of it is the Spirit of God carried people along to write what they wrote. It is the very voice of God, God speaking. Quick thing, you know this, you've heard it a lot from this pulpit. When Jesus was in an early controversy, what did he say? He said, have you not read what was spoken to you by God. What does the Lord Jesus do with Scripture? He equates the reading of Scripture with God speaking. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? So the Word of God can exist in a written form and an unwritten form. Thanks, I I agree. Powerful truth there. Now, just a quick thing from the New Testament itself. Again, today's a smattering of verses. That was Old Testament. And by the way, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, St. Paul makes that same reference. He says to the Thessalonians, uh, We commend you, Thessalonians, for receiving our word, not merely as the word of men, but for what it is, the very word of God that was preached to them, not written. As an example of the test they were to actually apply to teachers and prophets. In the New Testament, not exhaustive. You've got the apostles' formula, number one. The apostles' formula, have you noticed? Just look at Book of Romans, the Book of Romans. Read the first four chapters of the Book of Romans. And notice how the apostle Paul, an inspired apostle, actually buttresses his points. How does he, well, how does he demonstrate his points? Not on his own authority, as a lot of charlatans often do. What do they say? Well, this is true about God. Well, how do I know that? Because I'm speaking for God. Because I know because I'm the prophet, because I'm the leader, I'm the one who's given this, I've gotten this revelation on my authority. What's the apostle Paul do in Romans? When he is making his point about the gospel, he actually points where? To the Old Testament revelation of God. And he says what? What does the scripture say? He roots his arguments in the words of the living God. The reason Paul does that in Romans is to answer a hypothetical Jewish interlocutor who says that Paul is not being faithful to the covenant that God gave to Abraham, for example, to talk about uh, the importance of the law and the covenant that was given. Paul routinely cites the Old Testament in Romans to show a continuity between the covenant that was given to Abraham, for example, and how that covenant is fulfilled in Christ and how we are justified by faith in Christ and that a Christian does not have to become a good Jew first, that a Gentile can become a Christian without having to become a good Jew and being circumcised, for example, by being baptized into Christ, by dying and rising with him. But then, uh, so what Pastor Durbin here is saying, that even Paul, he, he he goes to the Word, to the Scriptures, yeah, to answer his Jewish opponents. But Paul didn't feel that way, that that was necessary. Go to Paul's letter to the Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 12. Here, what does Paul say? Does he say, what I have from you is exactly what was already given in the written word? It'll go back to Scripture, and here's my authority? No, Paul speaks from his own authority. Uh, he actually does what Pastor Durbin says he doesn't do, saying, I'm the prophet speaking for God. What Paul says is, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of of Jesus Christ, that the authority that God gives, uh, that St. Paul was speaking with, was not merely what was already written in the Old Testament, because there are many Jews who weren't willing to move beyond the Old Testament, but the authority from the living Christ that had been given to Paul to be able to preach and make a new revelation known. Say, what does the Scripture say? Scripture says, God says, in Scripture you see the apostles appeal to that as their foundation. Scripture teaches, therefore, you can believe that this is true. One note, as a side note, uh, neither the Lord Jesus or the apostles ever quoted from the Apocrypha with the divine formula of what does Scripture say, anything like that. Were they aware of the Apocrypha? Of course they were. Did they quote from the Apocrypha at times? Never with the divine formula. They saw it as sometimes useful historical information. The Apostle Paul even quoted from Aratus of Cilicia and Epimenides of Crete. These are pagan poets and prophets it's not saying that they are actually inspired. 
But in Scripture, when the apostles are appealing to something as true, they say, what does the Scripture say? Next. Uh, and this is a separate debate on the inspiration of the deuterocanonical books of Scripture. But it goes back to a point Pastor Durbin was making earlier about, oh, where's the canon of Scripture? Who decides it? Did the Church decide it? How do I know? And you never answered the question, but really, for Pastor Jeff and most Protestants, they know the canon of Scripture because their pastor and their parents told them this is the Bible. That's their tradition that they've inherited. So I would just say which tradition has a better historical pedigree. You know, so Pastor Durbin is saying the apostles and Jesus never quoted from these deuterocanonical books. Here's what Bruce Metzger, a Protestant author, writes. Nowhere in the New Testament is there a direct quotation from the canonical books of Joshua, Judges, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and Nahum. Uh, so there's lots of Old Testament books that are not quoted in the New Testament. That doesn't mean they're not inspired. So the Deuterocanonical books are not directly quoted by saying this is the word of the Lord. If that means those books are not inspired, you got to throw out a dozen books from the Old Testament as well that Pastor Durbin and other Protestants believe in, like Joshua or Esther or Ecclesiastes. All right, let's jump ahead here to the end. Um, what Pastor Durbin does next is he talks about the Korban rule, Matthew 15, Mark 7. And, you know, Jesus says, you make void the words of men by your, by sorry, you make void the word of God by your traditions, traditions of men. Jesus is not condemning all tradition here. He's condemning, he's not even condemming extra biblical things that the Pharisees added to the Old Testament and saying that they're wrong just because they weren't found in the Old Testament. What he was condemning was a interpretation of the Old Testament that was of human origin that said you could choose to not support your aging parents by giving your money to the temple as an offering, a korban or korbana, and so you didn't have to support your parents. Jesus said, no. The Old Testament says, honor your father and mother. If you don't give your money to help your parents and give it to the temple instead, you have made a vow you should have never made in the first place. It was invalid. You should be supporting your parents because that is what God said. The debate was not about God says this and the Pharisees said that. The debate was over what did God mean by what he said. That was the concern for them. And Jesus showed the correct interpretation of Scripture in that regard. So it was not about all traditions are bad. It's about whether uh, they were uh, properly understanding what the Word of God was. So when Jesus, he, Jesus never said tradition is bad. He said the traditions of men, your, your traditions, he said. But just because there are traditions that are of human rather than divine origin that contradict the Bible, that doesn't mean all tradition is bad any more than there are writings that are of human origin rather than divine origin, that claim to be divine. So even though there are false traditions that claim to be sacred traditions, that doesn't refute sacred tradition any more than there are false gospels and false biblical writings, things that claim to be divinely inspired, but actually aren't, like the apocryphal gospels of the early church, or the Book of Mormon, or the, the Quran. So just because Jesus condemns some traditions because they violate the Word of God, that does not mean the Word of God is only found in the written Word, and that there's no such thing as a sacred tradition. I'll just point you to 1 Corinthians 4, 6. It's in your bulletins today, that formulation of the early Christian creed. I think it's powerful. The Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says, Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. So here you have, in the early formation of the church, an inspired apostle appealing to what is apparently an early Christian creed. This is what they were saying to one another. They were saying this. They were confessing it. It was something they were passing along as a tradition, but it was a tradition that was rooted in biblical truth, and that was do not go beyond what is written. Another example. This is easily the worst biblical verse to try to rest the doctrine of sola scriptura upon. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, where Paul says, do not go beyond what is written. You may learn the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Scholars don't know what this verse exactly refers to. There are multiple interpretations. I read scholars who have proposed half a dozen different ways of understanding what do not go beyond what is written means. Even if it meant this is talking about sola scriptura, what does that mean? Do not go beyond what is written. What is written where? In the letter of 1 Corinthians? Does that mean that the Corinthians couldn't follow what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians because you can't go beyond what is written in 1 Corinthians? 
There is a lot of ambiguity when it comes to this verse, which makes it a terrible verse to rest the doctrine of Sola Scriptura on. So Pastor Durbin is confident, like, oh, well, this is just an early creed related to Sola Scriptura. (laughs) Biblical scholars are not that confident at all. Uh, Bradley Bittner, in his study of 1 Corinthians, this is what he says. In many ways, the history of scholarship on this verse resembles a demolition zone littered with the debris of collapsed and tottering hypotheses. Uh, The phrase, not beyond what is written, he says, this is the stone over which most interpreters have stumbled and has crushed the most hypotheses in the history of scholarship. So the matter is, we don't know what this refers to, and to draw Sola Scriptura out of it is a huge overreach. What it probably refers to is the example, the moral example, that St. Paul and Apollos and the others left for the Corinthians. Ronald Tyler says that what Paul is talking about, don't go beyond what is written, He's making an allusion to the fact that little kids, when they learn to write like they do today, they traced letters. They would trace them uh, to match them. So don't go beyond what is written in order to learn. Do what we do. And so this makes sense because later on, just a few verses later in chapter 4, Paul says he's a father to his children, and he wants them to be imitators of him, 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 16. That's just 10 verses later. And that's just one hypothesis. Could be many more but you can't get from this one verse that all Christian doctrine is explicitly and only found in Scripture. You can't get Sola Scriptura from that. Well, it's a famous one, you know it. In Acts 17, verse 11, Scripture pays a compliment. God in his word pays a compliment to the believers in Berea. Why? It says they were more noble-minded than the ones in Thessalonica. Why? Because when the Apostle Paul came to them, an inspired apostle with authority, comes to them, preaching to them, it says what about them? They searched the scriptures daily. To do what? To see if what Paul was saying was true. So the Berean Christians were saying, Paul, what's that? Okay, what's that? And then they were going to the word of God to see if what he was saying was actually true. More noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. They were testing the words of the apostle Paul. How many of us, if Paul came in here right now and started preaching, you would just be like, like, just, t- just take it all in and not thinking critically, ultimately, right? Just accepting. But they're like, well, hang on now. Wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me see. Let me, well, they were like this. Let me see. Let me, let me see. Where, where does it say that? They're testing what the Apostle Paul says. Okay, final points here. This is a common misunderstanding of Acts 17.11 that Protestants use to promote the doctrine of Sola Scriptura. So when Paul says that in Berea, that the Bereans were more noble-minded, it says because they searched the Scriptures daily— It's not because they searched the scriptures to confirm what Paul said and that they practiced sola scriptura. It's that they gave Paul a fair hearing. And to know that, we have to think, okay, if what was noble about the Bereans was that they searched scripture, what's noble about that? Was it because they didn't want to believe something false, so they they practiced an ancient form of sola scriptura? No, to know what was noble about the Bereans, you have to look and see what was ignoble, what was what was bad about the Thessalonians, and what was bad about the Thessalonians was not— this would support Sola Scriptura if Paul went and he preached to the Thessalonians, and they just accepted whatever he said gullibly, and Paul said, you are gullible, you should compare this to the Old Testament. That's not what happened. Paul preached to the Thessalonians, and then some of them, Jews and Gentiles, were converted— but others were not, and they started a riot and drove Paul out of town. They didn't give him a fair hearing. So when Paul goes to Berea, he preaches. Some Jews and Gentiles are converted, but guess what? They don't start a riot. They gave him a fair hearing. That if this was a message about Sola Scriptura, it would compare the Thessalonians' gullibility in receiving a message without comparing it to the Old Testament. In fact, the Thessalonians, some of them who did not accept Paul's message, probably said, hey, Paul, you're saying the Messiah will rise in three days? That's not what it says. It doesn't say that anywhere here in the Old Testament that he will be crucified and rise three days later. It doesn't say that here in the Old Testament. You're, you're a fraud. You, you are, uh, you know, you're leading us away from the true God. That would be an extreme application of Sola Scriptura that says the Word of God is only found in the written Word and could not have been preached by the Apostle Paul. So Acts 17.11 only proves that the Bereans were noble because they were willing to listen to Paul and hear what he had to say, and that they loved Scripture and they loved divine revelation, not that everything we believe 
is going to be found only in the written word alone. And Acts 17.11 doesn't show that, 1 Corinthians 4.6 and 2 Timothy 3.16. None of these verses prove this more fleshed-out understanding of what sola scriptura is. Uh, And finally, I will just say that I was waiting for it this entire sermon, and I was just baffled that Pastor Durbin never referred to it. He didn't refer to 2 Timothy 3.17, which is what most apologists do refer to, and I talk about that in my video uh, regards to Pastor Mike Winger, who does go to 2 Timothy 3.17 a lot, and I engage him there. But I was really surprised Pastor Durbin, in an entire sermon on Sola Scriptura, never went to 2 Timothy 3.17. If you want to hear my thoughts on that, check out some of my videos, my rebuttals of Pastor Mike Winger. I hope this was helpful uh, to you all. If you want more content like this, though, uh, consider supporting us at trendhornpodcast.com. Listen to my podcast there and help us create more videos like this one. So thank you all very much.